Welcome, everyone. This is another episode of todebate.net. I am Sebastian, one of your two co-hosts, and my co-host, as usual, is my dear friend, Dirk. What's up? Who was How are we doing today? Oh, well, well, I guess you're much better because a couple of days you were a little bit sick. Yes. Is it what? Winter, winter is coming, as they say? Or it they gives to me say? a surge of energy to sit here with you, to debate with you also. I don't want to show any weakness because you, you strive on weakness when we debate. Ah, that's interesting. Do you know, this is what I read in, uh, I think it's Tim Ferriss's Tools of Titans, I believe, or Tribe of Mentors, I don't remember. He was interviewing Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. I think it's the transcript of the podcast, actually. And Schwarzenegger initially started uh, as, how do you say, bodybuilder yeah. in his career before being an actor and then governor of California, uh, or ex-governor now. And uh, what's interesting is he used a psycho psychological tactic, and I think I may have mentioned this before in a podcast, maybe, I don't remember. Uh, if I, I'm probably repeating myself because I'm getting old. Um, and if you don't remember this, and if our listeners are not remembering, they're getting old, and you're getting old. <laughs> it's okay. It's life. So the psychological trick he used on his um, opponents uh, in bodybuilding competitions was to, in the locker room, look at other guys who were actually perfectly fit and tell them, is there everything okay with your knee? And it makes people very self-aware and self-conscious and wondering if there's actually something wrong with your knee or with your elbow or whatever, right? which actually psychologically makes you weaker when it comes to actually competing right after. It may or may not have an effect, but... Statistically, it actually seems to be proven that you would have an effect on others because you're implying a planting doubt in their minds that something is wrong with them. Yeah, there is a there is an. Are you feeling okay today, Dirk? Are you feeling okay, Dirk? Because I see that you're uh, drooling a bit. There is a fascinating documentary <laughs> that you you find on YouTube as well. That's called Pumping Iron. Pumping Iron tells the story of the young Arnold Schwarzenegger back then when he was a bodybuilder and he actually um, won the the Mr. Universe uh, competition a few times and there is a moment in the documentary where you see that in action where he basically has a conversation with his strongest opponent and you would say up until that point it's not really it's not really clear if Arnold Schwarzenegger can win it one more time. But I swear to you, you see the guy break in that conversation. It's like you, between Arnold Schwarzenegger and the guy, if you watch this, you kind of see the moment when Arnold really? practically won. So yeah, I, pumping I recommend iron. Pumping Iron. I recommend that documentary in general for, I mean, it's a weird, a weird scene. And Arnold is a weird guy. That's That's for sure. But it's a very interesting documentary. I'm trying to see if it's on YouTube. It is on YouTube. It is It is on YouTube indeed. Yeah. Uh, if you search for it, you will see 3.4 million views and 74 minutes long. Excellent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download this for my next flight. All right. Excellent. Thanks for the recommendation. So now I'm interested in hearing how you transitioned from Arnold Schwarzenegger pumping iron psychological warfare to our motion of today. Well, uh, it seems that maybe some companies are not doing great. So, uh, is everything all, all, all right? <laughs> is everything <laughs> <laughs> shit? This is such this is such a terrible transition. <laughs> great. And since, and, since and, and since we're both Europeans and probably rooting for for European companies, I guess it's good. you're not you're you're probably going to agree with me, right? But the American company, the big giant Boeing. It's not doing that great, is it? Oh. Right. I see. I see the knee of Boeing a little bit weak. Yeah, the, the knee the of feet. Boeing is a little bit weak. Uh, let's see if Boeing can pump a little bit more iron. Yeah. You. Uh, but well, you suggested the motion, and you were. I mean, you. You. You were pretty dark by asking the question: Is Boeing doomed? And uh, that's the motion of today. I Boeing is doomed. Is the motion, and we argue over it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I thought with the uh, crashes that were mentioned a lot in the press last year in Indonesia and earlier this year in Ethiopia, both because of the, was it a 737? 737 Max, 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 yeah. Max 8 uh, uh, denomination of the plane for Boeing, both crashed apparently because of this automated system which takes into account the angle of the airflow, especially at takeoff. And if the angle is too steep, there's a risk that the plane is stalling. So automatically, the software would put the nose down 
um, to prevent from this uh, prevent this from happening. Unfortunately, it seems the pilots and the manual was not explaining this properly enough, and that the correction of the of the nose would be quite steep and quick to the point that it becomes almost impossible if there is a mistake at the input, the data input level, which is apparently what happened in those two crashes. So ever since, these planes have been grounded. All the aviation authorities around the world, not starting by the US, surprisingly, surprisingly, because usually it's the country of origin of a manufacturer which decides to ground the plane and then everyone follows suit because that's the way it usually happens. But I think it started off with maybe China and or maybe Europe, I can't remember, and then the US finally decided to also ground the planes. So ever since, all these planes and hundreds of potentially new planes which have been produced since then are sitting on the ground and uh, parked on the ground and there is no resolution in sight for now. Um, it seems that the planes are not going to fly again before at least January, if I'm not mistaken. So that's the status. It's actually a big fiasco for the company. But the question is, is this potentially a doomsday scenario for Boeing in the long term or the short term or not? Or is it just a mishap that all companies experience, especially, um, and well, not especially, but even if, if it's pertaining, pertaining to the lives of people, of the customers of, uh, of the company? So that's the context. Sorry, it's a bit long, but it's just to remind people of what we're talking about. And uh, yeah, that's it. I don't know. Is there anything else you want to add for the context? Um. No, I think you covered everything I would have uh, covered there as well. I have nothing else to add. Boeing, of course, is a very flashy example, but we get to that in our actual debate. All right, let's do it. You're the first one to go, as usual. Our uh, repeat listeners would know that we select sides randomly uh, a few days or a few weeks prior to recording this podcast. So that gives us time to prepare our side, but we don't know what the other side has prepared. So every time we respond to the others, uh, the other side's arguments is actually pretty much live in the sense that we are uh, discovering these arguments and preparing our response. And, uh, and that's it. So that makes for the fun of it. Some is prepared and some is improvised. You have two minutes, my dear friend, to expose your arguments before you get thrashed by me. No pressure, no science, no psychology. I think my, 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 knee, is, my knee is hurting now. Your brain's going to hurt soon. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues against the motion. Boeing is doomed, you say. I very much doubt that, honestly. And the reason why I'm doubting that is straightforward pure mathematics boeing is one of the two leading aircraft manufacturers on this planet the other one airbus actually airbus loses more money right now than boeing did because of the a380 fiasco for instance so argument number one boeing is still making way more profit than any other airplane manufacturer it has a solid revenue. Yes, it has to cut losses. Yes, it makes less revenue than before because the 737 MAX uh, disaster. But it's still a solid 60 billion revenue per quarter. I doubt that this company goes down anytime soon. Secondly, because it's so big and because companies of that size tend to be governmentally important, it's too big to fail. Before Boeing goes down, the U.S. Gover government will uh, jump in and help them. Thirdly, I don't even think that uh, this problem, this uh, callback, this tech uh, disaster is big enough to really have a long-lasting effect. If, uh, if any indication, you can look into technology history. There have been massive technical failures in the past, sometimes costing hundreds of lives. Uh, car manufacturers had to call back billions of cars at times. And all of these car manufacturers are still around. If that's any indication, why should Boeing be any different? Yeah, so overall, no, Boeing is not doomed. If anything, Boeing continue to strive. <laughs> And now on to 
Sebastian. Let's hear his argument. People are scared. And when people are scared, people don't use the products that scare them. And this is what's happening with Boeing. It has seriously damaged its credibility as a company to produce safe planes. People have refused to take the, the MAX 8 planes when they were not grounded yet by the U.S. authorities. Now, what you could say is that over time, people will forget. It is true. Like terrorist attacks, people come back to these touristic places where terrorist attacks have happened. Over the years, things uh, change. The problem here is there's so many mistakes that have been committed, unlike any other incident in the history of aviation or maybe other technical failures, that I think it has damaged the credibility, the trust uh, of, uh, of people, of consumers and customers towards Boeing. Let's go through a list of these mistakes. And the way I see them, they're roughly um, at three levels. One, communications. Very poor communications as to what happened and deflecting blame and not accepting blame initially. I think that was a, that's terrible for user trust in general. Second subset um, of problems, it's and, and, I will, and we'll go through three engineering problems here, which really worries me for a company which is building things, which is an engineering company. First of all, poor design of the planes. So desperate to win market share, Boeing put larger engines on the same plane frame. And that, that was a problem because of the dimensions of these larger engines. So they had to make these adjustments of where to put them along the plane, more forward or backwards. Uh, whether you're talking about the newer or the older planes. So that was already a mistake from an engineering standpoint, trying to desperately retrofit something. The second mistake, no backup sensor used. There was just one source of data, and that failed. Then tough luck, you're dead. That's a massive engineering mistake. Now, it can happen, but when you add this to the previous mistake I mentioned, it becomes really worrisome. Add to this a third issue. Trying to solve hardware problems, the fact that you have a larger engine or a misconfiguration with a software fix, really? Really? Do I really want to believe in engineering design when you're trying to fix a hardware issue with software? I'm worried. Orders are being cancelled. It's very tricky on a longer term basis. It reduces the amount of cash flow, the investment in new planes, the investment in innovation, and even keeping employee and employees happy. Right or wanting wanting to innovate. So overall, I am really worried about Boeing's long term fate, and I'll come back to other things we've mentioned later on because I'm out of time. Now it's Dirk's turn. Let's hear his rebuttal. All the things that you mentioned are good points. They work for Boeing as much as they work against Boeing. Why is that? By now, everyone who wants to know kind of heard the whole story about how the 737 MAX crashed. So we all heard about the 737 MAX 8 actually being a repurposed uh, 737 something else. And that the main reason they did it the way they did it was to comply, uh, to not be forced into getting a full-blown new airline in, off the ground because that requires a lot of licensing effort and so on. So they decided to go with an existing model, put other engines on it, stretch it a little and fix it with software. All these things we know. That will work for Boeing. Because they can say, okay, mistake made, we learn from it. Here's the campaign to reinstate trust. Speaking about trust, that is a key factor, and you mentioned it. And you had on, uh, Boeing is not selling airplanes. Boeing is selling trust in their machinery. So let's talk about this. Right now, there are 10,000 Boeings in operation, and compare that to the 300 737 MAX that are grounded. Since the 737 MAX 8 have been grounded, orders of 737 MAX 8s are still coming in. Airlines still believe in that airplane. I heard voices of pilots saying, the machine is a good plane. There has been a design flaw that the design flow needs to be a uh, flaw needs to be addressed. But in general, it's an awesome plane. If you, as a passenger, hear the, these words from pilots, you're gonna reconsider if it's really that bad. And I personally flew with Boeing machines since. We are both frequent travelers, for better or worse. And I bet you 
just boarded Boeings just the same. Knowing that it's not a 737 MAX 8, you probably were just sitting in Boeings uh, like you were sitting in Boeings before. Also knowing the statistics that even if every day a Boeing crashes out of the sky, it's it's still pretty unlikely that it hits you. So I don't, don't think that this this will impact Boeing all that much. Also comparing to what happened in the history. I give you one example. Audi had a car on the ground once that accelerated sometimes while pressing the brake. So you were literally pressing the brake in that car and it was speeding up. That killed 700 people. It was a major callback for Audi. Is it, did that kill Audi? Did that serve for the purpose of uh, killing trust in Audi cars? No, I don't think so. Neither will it uh, happen to Boeing. Another thing, commercial airlines, as important as they are and as critical they are to Boeing's success, it's not their own line of business. They are a defense contractor. They sell security solutions. They are a financial institution as well. None of these three things will die, even if the airline business takes a hit. So, no, they are not doomed. They will continue to be around and they will continue being the world's largest airline manufacturer. Next up, Sebastian. Let's hear it. So it's interesting what you said about these massive technical failures for the car manufacturers. I think there's two things I'd like to respond to that. First of all, don't you think consumers today are a little bit more conscious of these safety flaws and they react a bit more angrily at them than maybe a few decades ago? I, I, I think that people get a little bit more conscious on this aspect in terms of trust. But I would say something which I think is more important than this. Not important in terms of it, that people don't care or people are, care less or more than before. It's more the innovation aspect. I do think common manufacturers as they exist today will probably die for the most part, actually. Not only because of technical failures, but because of another point I'd like to raise here with you, and that's the lack of innovation. If these car manufacturers do not embrace, let's say, electric vehicles quickly enough, or self-driving cars, or both, they will not exist in the decades to come. I am pretty sure this is a very easy prediction to make. And this is what worries me with Boeing. It's this lack of innovation. The A380 was, for better or worse, an innovation. It was a commercial fiasco, but it was a technical innovation. It may be not a groundbreaking innovation. I'm not qualified to say this. But this is what worries me with Boeing's attitude here. It tries to retrofit an old plane design with slightly better engines, slightly power, more powerful engines, or consuming less fuel. It doesn't feel there's a lot of innov innovation going on. And you say it's too big to fail. Well, Lehman Brothers was a bank. And it was not saved by the American taxpayer. So who knows? In this case, it is true. Boeing has the military uh, contracts. But I would say, and this may be a longer term thing, maybe a, a room for another debate. Longer term, the U.S. is bankrupt. Today, the U.S. can borrow money because the interest rates are fairly low around the world and because everyone trusts the U.S. to pay back its money. But the U.S. debt is massive. It's absolutely massive, and the world is changing. The world is changing. The superpowers of tomorrow are not the U.S. They're China, they're India, they're Indonesia. So on the long-term long -term basis, there will come a point when the U.S. will be expected to pay back, and the U.S. may not be able to afford sustaining companies just for the sake of having a stronger army or military uh, aspect. This is another debate, but I think there is a longer-term uh, play here. Also, uh, the lack of innovation in general, the re reason why this matters, I think it's a recipe for failure on the long term. Most companies which were listed on the NASDAQ 40 years ago do not exist today anymore. For a bunch of reasons, but among those reasons, it's a lack of innovation. I think the poor design and the general mismanagement of the crisis are the last nails in the coffin for Boeing. You also mentioned there are the two leading manufacturers with Airbus. Yes, but there's increasing competition. Today, it's mostly a duopoly. But China, potentially India, and Brazil today are other big players. They're not waiting for Boeing to innovate, and they won't wait. Right? The big markets of tomorrow are China for, for planes, are India, and are Africa. They're not going to go for Boeing necessarily, an American player. They may go for their homegrown solutions. 
So beyond the user trust, which I think is evolving, but we can debate on this, I think there's this lack of innovation, which is, I think, critical. And I worry that the poor engineering decisions, the poor management decision, the poor communication decisions will actually doom Boeing on a fairly mid, on a, on a midterm basis to a long-term basis. Final statements. Dirk goes first. So the US will go bankrupt, and when they are bankrupt, they will not be able to bail out Boeing. All right, so let's take a slightly less long-term view than for the sake of our debate, because, you know, the US will not be bankrupt in the next 10 years or so. And maybe China and India and all the others will come up, but uh, for the sake of Boeing... They are not the Lehman Brothers. There are no alternatives. If Boeing goes down, then the US has no hold on the airline market. And Boeing being a defense contractor actually gives them a pretty strong foothold. So as long as the US is around, they will hold a hand or two over Boeing, as is Europe over Airbus. Airbus wouldn't exist without governmental money. Another thing, you mentioned innovation. I'm not sure how you ground the claim that Boeing is not innovating. Interestingly, they have their innovation centers in India and China. They train more than 5,000 engineers right now in those innovation centers. They just started uh, eight months ago an um, artificial intelligence company branch of their own. There is plenty of innovation going on. We just don't know enough about it. And I will leave you with that claim because overall, um, we already see that Boeing is coming back on their feet. So they are not doomed and they will continue to strive. Sebastian. I do recognize it's a, it's a bet I'm making uh, by being obviously choosing or having the side to say that Boeing is doomed and that's why I'm trying to bring this very specific argument. It is true that Boeing is trying innovation. I had actually to look it up. Indeed, there is no media coverage. But that's a, that's a sign, in my opinion, when you're not actually hearing much about it. If you look at the car industry, the innovator in that space, for better or worse, you know, I'm not trying to judge here, is Tesla. Right? Everyone talks about Tesla. They may not survive, actually, for a bunch of reasons. And maybe Ford and others will be able to take uh, the, the relay um, of electric vehicles afterwards, including on the luxury segment or BMW and, and Audi. But um, the fact that we're not hearing about Boeing, a major player around the world, an industry player, is, is worrying to me. I know they have these initiatives. I looked it up also, and they have interesting initiatives around uh, electric aircraft. I think that's a very interesting proposal, especially for environment, environmentally conscious people, consumers. Um, but I think they've, they've damaged too much of their, their image with what happened here. And I think there's a, an inherent, intrinsic problem with the engineering leadership, with the management of the company, and with the comms uh, team um, at Boeing. And I'm not sure they changed or learned from, that, from these lessons because repeatedly, one after the other, they made these mistakes. So I am worried that they may actually um, damage their company, their company prospects for the, for the, for the midterm or the long term. You have a point about the defense contract. It's not going to happen anytime soon that the, the U.S. becomes bankrupt. So I neglected this point. So they may not be doomed because of this, but in that case, they, in, they would still disappear, maybe, very likely, in my opinion, as a commercial aircraft company. All right. So what do you think, dear listeners? Are, is Boeing doomed or not? By the way, on that note, Sebastian, you, you've seen the uh, news, uh, right, that China built their own full-fledged commercial airliner recently? No, I was not aware. Actually. Okay, so they, they, they it made, made big news because before that, China was building airlines, but they had to buy everything from the engine to the, the general construction, the electronics. And they want to. They aspire to be a very, at the very least, the the third largest airline manufacturer of the world soon. That's the, well, the general idea. I, I'm I'm pretty sure that we become the first one. They have such a huge market, and they're. If you look at all the other industries, yeah. Chinese industries, they're invading India. They 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 consider India basically their next big market. They completely. They, it's not that they don't care about the other markets. If you look at the smartphone industry. Um, services in terms of apps and that kind of stuff. I'll give you one stat, which is public. 
At the end of 2017, that's a year and a half ago, you look at the top 100 Android apps in India. Top 100. 17 apps were Chinese. 17. That was 19, 18 months ago. 6 months ago, so 12 months later, how many Chinese apps are in the top 100 in India? Going from 17 to how many? 70. You're too high. 44. Almost half of the top 100 are Chinese-made apps. Right? And it's just to show that they're really invading other markets. They already have a huge domestic market. So I really think China's going to lead in so many areas. And the, and the reason why I have this inflection in my voice is because I think it's worrisome when you have a non-democratic government, uh, which is behind or half behind secretly uh, some of these things. And you don't know what the use is going to be made of it, military-wise. Yeah. Um... You don't seem to be worried. We're gonna we're gonna gonna see what happens. We're gonna see what happens. But China wants to be at least a significant force in the market. Right now they are still dwarfed by Airbus and Boeing, but I do think the story of Airbus shows that you can force these things. You can force yourself on the market if your government wants to have that. Airbus is fairly young, right? It's from the seventies, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. I actually don't remember exactly. I think it's a forty-year-old yes. company. And right? the, the I by now I looked it up. By the way, so the the airline they 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 started was uh, the C nine one nine, and it's a direct competitor to the A three twenty, and already seven hundred machines were ordered. As you said, uh, the traffic that they traffic requirements they have in mainland China alone makes it very likely that they succeed. And he, but even China, even beyond China, like all of Southeast Asia, South Asia, they, they are going to dominate. It's not going to be Europeans yes. or Americans. And that's and maybe I didn't make my, my point forcefully enough. And I know I'm making a bet. Like of course this is exaggerating by saying one is doomed or not. But uh, yeah, I think the American market is saturated. I don't think that they, we're not going to need more planes in Europe or the U.S. Our demographics are going to go declining in the next few decades. But well, unless we accept mm -hmm. a bit of immigration. We're not going to need more planes. And if anything, people look at Sweden. Domestic flights in Sweden have decreased ever, ever since they're a bit more conscious of the, of the global yeah. warming effect of flying. Domestic uh, passenger volume in Sweden has decreased. I don't think it's guaranteed for companies to exist forever. And, 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 and the driver for this is innovation. Yes, they're sitting on tons of revenue and a pipeline of orders, but I think it's very short term. It's very short term. I mean, when I say short term, it's like five years, ten years. But here's the thing. Um, if you go long term enough, then every company is doomed. Every company except for the Catholic Church, maybe. <laughs> and at every other company, <laughs> every other company dropped out of the race ever since. No one is around from back then. <laughs> so you have to have something like a realistic time horizon. And that's a couple of decades, maybe. All right. Yes, um, you're right. And... I, I do personally think that we will not, not in our lifetime, uh, we, will, we will see Boeing flying around for the next decades. I, I doubt that they are doomed. I do think they're going to come back from this. And there have been so many incidents in other fields where I felt like, oh, this is damaging the company. Oh, this is fatal for them. And they, they keep coming up, coming back. To be fair, I'm I'm uh, back to the debate. I'm more more leaning towards what you're thinking. I, I it's, the, it's the randomness of the sides which made me defend my side, but I I do tend to agree with you. I don't. I'm not sure Boeing is innovative enough. That I maintain. Yeah. Whether that will be enough to kill them, I'm not. So, I'm not so sure. I actually tend to agree with you. I think it will be around. It will remain a big player, maybe not the biggest player. Uh, I think they're. Then I just. Don't, I don't think they have the the innovative spirit i'm not sure like as an engineer you want to i don't know maybe but you, i'm wrong maybe they maybe engineers today go ahead go here's ahead. the thing the, the one question that i want to throw in in um, throw your way in response to all what you're saying about innovation i'm not convinced that innovation is the make it or break it trade that keeps you in business or not there are so many forces at play and there are so many companies out there that arguably have been more innovative than their competitors. And the prime example of this is VHS versus Super 8. That's like the classical example of this, where one was arguably the one, uh, the, the more innovative ones and the other one just was better in marketing their, their stuff. And I completely agree with you to the point that um, if what I mean by innovation, and this is, is is multiple things, and I actually covered beyond that. And let me give you an example, which is going your way. Kodak. I did not know 
The engineers at Kodak's a department had actually invented the digital camera. But, and this is an analysis, not by me, but it was an article in the Financial Times of, I think, someone who did a thesis on, the, on this aspect. And the main driver was not the lack of innovation at Kodak. It was the organizational structure, which was driven by the, the analog, the, the film, the negative film, uh, that was not receptive to this innovation coming from inside, and it was not... It just did not surface up to the management, and this is why I'm emphasizing the poor engineering decision, the poor management team, the poor communication team. I am worried organizationally for Boeing beyond the mm -hmm. innovation aspect. So even though they are innovating, that's why I said at the end, indeed I was surprised that they actually have investment with JetBlue, I think, in some electric aircraft company. But I am worried that their leadership is just, is just, make, is just killing the company. I am worried about this. Like I, I think they're... they're sh I don't know. I don't know the company well enough, but it gave me the impression that I would probably want to change the entire leadership team at all levels. Isn't that the CEO, isn't that true? the communication isn't team? Isn't that true for almost all companies out there? <laughs> but in this case, yeah. in, in this case, the, the thing is, with other companies, they're not faced with a massive yeah, crisis. Yeah, you're right. So we don't know how they, we don't know how they would respond. They, most people are not. I mean, most people. A lot of people are not very impressive. But how, what do you know what what they would do? Right? You may think they would not react, but we don't have the proof of it. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, they, they continue, they continue along. Yeah. Right. And Kodak was probably the same thing, right? Maybe the Kodak executives are great people. And they went and they and after the fact it's easy to say, right, that they missed the opportunity. And so many other companies missed the, the opportunity. In this case, I think it's so blatant in the way it was mishandled at so many levels, like from the engineering side, from the from the business angle, from a business decision. It reminds me of the challenger uh, crash in the 80s in, 19, in 1986 where it was the engine the management pressure on engineers who failed to insist that they could not fly at sub whatever temperature in florida on that surprising day where the temperature was low and the o-rings started uh leaking i think the the oxygen or, or the or i can't remember the the chemical and then it blew up right? and and the reason here was um, this this inability inability for engineers to speak up or or impose their veto because they were contractors and the management team, which is imposing. Mm -hmm. And in this case, both are to blame. Right? It's a classic case study. But this is why I think this is, I think it will be very make a very interesting case study, actually, this this these two crashes and the way the company responded as an as a way to not react, as a way to as as their decision ten years ago to decide, you know what, we're not gonna innovate. We're too late behind Airbus, we're just gonna use a null plane and retrofit larger engines. Oh, the engines are touching the ground. Oh, there's uh, let's lift, let's let's switch uh, let's put the wings a little bit forward. Oh shit, it's making the the plane dive a bit too much. Oh, let's have some software. And I I read extensively about the thing because I I'm I scared of flying, although I fly a lot. So I read a lot about the topic, and and the more I read, the more the more scary it was. So it made me think that organizationally they're not equipped. But, they're not equipped for so, the future. But here's the thing. I am willing to. I am willing. I'm putting my hand up. I'm willing to be CEO of Boeing if anyone hears me. I'm and willing for, to help. For a low double digit million salary figure, right? I don't need the money. Honestly. Okay. I don't so even need the every, money. If anyone from Boeing free. or any one of the one dollar. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian does it for free. So if that's not a that's a steal. I mean I will I will give back the compensation of the CEO to all the workers. <laughs> How is that? <laughs> um, hey, I, ju I just wanted to say, elect me, elect me president, and I'll give you the president's salary to all the citizens. It's probably like five cents. Beautiful. Um, I just wanted to say one thing. Contrary to what you're saying, I do think it sounds to us scary to have software correcting for things like this and uh, causing a crash when it malfunctions. But in reality, this is a normal thing. I think it's software and hardware that keeps your car from exploding. It's uh, it's software that uh, that keeps planes in the air already, even without that system. Um, and the question is just a question of volatility, right? So if you if you, for instance, look into the high-speed planes that are used in the military, those planes are famous for actually not being able to fly a straight line without software. Because you always have to strike a balance between being stable in the air or being very quick to maneuver. So, uh, so um, fighting planes, fighting planes where when the computer crashes, the plane crashes. 
it's that simple. To be fair, what I discovered by reading about this topic and, to, and going your way, actually Boeing historically and still today is much more a manual, manually driven plane and Airbus is much more on the automated part. Yeah. They were the first one uh, so, to introduce yeah, the, yeah. The, the the joystick like uh, control. The, I'm not sure. And the wings too, yes. right? And the wings. They introduced the wings to plane. Not sure who was the first one to introduce wings. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's wrap up. If you, dear listener, just, have an opinion on the matter after listening to our ramblings, please don't hesitate to head over to our webpage to debate.eu or to debate.net, whatever you prefer, and click on the thumbs up, thumbs down button. Thumbs up if you say Sebastian was right, Boeing is doomed. Thumbs down if you say... And, and I should be CEO to it save is it. Is not, uh, also thumbs up if you feel like uh, only Sebastian can save it. Um, <laughs> 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 All right, that's... I mean, it's the same th the same likelihood that they click thumbs up, Sebastian, because clearly I had the bad arguments, but uh, that's for our listeners to decide. <laughs> you had good arguments. I'll concede <laughs> that you had good no, arguments. No, 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 no. You're damaging your chances to win. This is still something where we compare. No, that's just psychological tactics so my that, that my listeners think <laughs> think that I'm humble for this time. So, oh, he's so nice. I'm going to vote for him. But now that I've said that, I've damaged my chances. Uh, now people are back to square one and have to really listen to our arguments and understand which one they better... They, they will better. have to. Anyway, give us that mighty click. But feeds yes, us, right? That was keeps us <laughs> in the air. Anyway, it was fun. Thank you, Sebastian, for debating. And Thank you again to see you. See you soon. Talk soon. Bye. Bye.